The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. So thrilled to be here with you on this Thursday before Valentine's Day. I've been trying to trot my red out today, <laughs> all this week to wear red whenever possible. Uh, it's a great week to celebrate a lot of different things about love and being in love and having love uh, for all the people in our lives, right? So uh, we've got a really exciting show planned for you today. We're gonna be with you live for the next two hours, talking about autism from a 360 degree perspective. Uh, but we always like to remind you at the start of the show that this whole show is meant to be interactive. We wanna participate with you. You are really the person who is driving the discussion whenever you want to be, right? No pressure, uh, but we want you to participate. We wanna know your thoughts, your feelings, your concerns, your questions. Questions. And so Kelby's going to show you some of the different ways that you can interact with us here at the show. I'll remind you that our homepage is autism-live.com. When you go there, so many things to do. I would ask you to please sign up for our free email list. It is free. There's no charge. You get a free newsletter at the start of every month. And at the start of every week, you get a little viewing guide that tells you what's going to be on this week with also some links to the th some interviews that we thought were particularly exceptional the week before. We also use that uh, email list to notify you when something big is going to happen and when we don't have time to tell you on the show, which is frequently what happens when we have Dr. Temple Grandin on. We don't get a whole lot of notice when she's available to be with us, and that's how we let our peeps know. So uh, make sure that you sign up for that. Also, you can be watching the live show on our homepage, autism-live.com, although you can also watch the live show on our YouTube page, and we just want to point that out. But on our homepage there are other things to do as well like the live feature you can participate on the live feature you look at those series of white boxes that are just to the side of the screen and you put your cur cursor in the one that says your question start typing hit enter and voila it shows up here on my desktop and you and I can have a conversation but more importantly than that you can have a conversation with our guests which who, who are often experts in the field of autism uh, some of the most brilliant minds in the field of autism that we have available for you to chat with. So I hope that you will participate. And by the way, I like it when you chat with me as well. I, I like that conversation. I could go bonkers. Uh, we have a, a relatively small studio and I could sometimes feel like I'm just sitting in here talking to myself, talking up my sleeve. Uh, so I love it when you talk to me and tell me what's going on with you, even if it's that you tell me what the weather is like there, right? Doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be questions. We don't have to solve the world's problems today. Uh, but I do like having the conversation. And I always like to remind you that uh, while we do have experts on the show, I just am not one of them. How about that? Uh, I am a mom and I'm a former teacher and I love my son who was diagnosed with autism. Uh, He's, he was two and a half when he was diagnosed. He's uh, 11 and a half now. So it was quite a while ago in dog years and uh, we have had a tremendous journey because we got access to help and support and really good quality ABA and other things as well though too. We got you know support for me and support for us as a family and that has made all the difference and I feel like I'm just the luckiest person on the face of the earth. Talk about Valentine's Day. I have two of the swellest guys in the world in, uh, that I live with and call family, my husband and my son, and I'm, I am so lucky. And I, 
I always like to say that I, I want to help you to be as lucky as I am and luckier. Let's let you be luckier. Um, but if you have the right support to let you know that you're doing the right thing and to give you the tools that you need, then you get lucky. Uh, it looks different for all of us, right? Um, but what we do know is that there's progress available to each and every one of us and to every person who's on the autism spectrum. So join me. Whether you're a parent, a teacher, a practitioner, or a person who's on the spectrum yourself, we hope that you can find something here that helps you to get to the progress and to the good stuff. I'm always talking about the good stuff because, you know, what's what's not the good stuff is always available to us and we can always dish about that. And sometimes we do. And don't get me started. I can rant about stuff. Right. Uh, I love that somebody wrote in about Dr. Doreen's rant yesterday uh, and that you said, LOL, I love that she's so compassionate, not only for our kids, but for us parents as well. And thanks for sticking up for us. And I'll make sure that she knows about that. Also want to remind you, since I'm noticing that above that, somebody had a comment for uh, Dr. Copeland, that next Tuesday, when we're back on the show, uh, in the second hour, it's the third Tuesday of the week, and that's the time when Dr. Copeland comes. Dr. Copeland is a developmental pediatrician, which is a great thing, great person to ask a lot of questions, but she also happens to be a BCBA, a board certified behavior analyst. So send your questions in. I'm really looking to send to her the questions that we're going to have her answer on Tuesday later on today. So load them up. Say, I want, you know, this is for Dr. Copeland, and send them on our way. All right, we like to start every morning with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. Yes, the jargon du jour. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to make sense of it within our world so that we can figure out how, what does this mean for me today? How does this help me get to the progress and to the good stuff? Okay, our jargon for today is reinforcer. Okay. This is a term that we use all the time on the show. Uh, it's so funny to me that before my son was diagnosed with autism, I, you know, this is a term that we use in life, right? Something is reinforced by something else. But usually we're talking about construction. I don't know, maybe that was just my world. And then all of a sudden everybody was talking about, well, is this a reinforcer? Is that a reinforcer? What are the things that reinforce your child? What's reinforcing you? And it annoyed me to no end. Uh, but I'll tell you something. Once you figure out what this is and what it means to you and what it means to the loved one that you're working with, ooh, man, is this something that you can harness and it's energy right there, something you can touch. So let's take a look at what a reinforcer is. We'll go to our actual definition. And you know I love these actual definitions, and this is a good one to make fun of. A reinforcer is a stimulus slash event delivered contingent on the exhibition of a behavior, which increases the probability of that behavior continuing to occur or occurring more often often in the future. For example, if the child enjoys being tickled, tickles may be used as a potential reinforcer for correct responding or appropriate behavior. Right? And this is why we do jargon of the day. Because if you have no idea what it looks like for, you know, and you read this, you go, huh, what, a stimulus slash event? What does that look like? Okay, so let's go on to our working definition so that we can try to put this in some terms that we can better understand. A reinforcer is something that acts as a reward for your child or for any individual and motivates him or her to continue engaging in a particular behavior good or bad. Okay. So, you know, y here you are and you are working really hard today and all throughout the day as you're working hard, you're thinking, oh man, I can't wait to go home and kick off my shoes and I'm going to, you know, I'm, I have DVR'd my favorite program. I'm going to kick off my shoes and I'm going to get to watch that program. So that's your reinforcer. It's helping you to get through your entire day because you're going to reward yourself. You you know, if I do X, Y, and Z, and I finish my day out, and I get home, I'm going to get to have that. It's a reinforcer. It's the end. And if you know that you're going to get that on a regular basis, that if you go to work, you get to come home and watch the program that you want to watch, then you're more likely to do whatever the thing was before, in this case, going to work. Uh, the same is true of everyone. We all have things that reinforce us, that help us to keep doing something. And when we don't continue to do something that we 
know we should, it's because there wasn't enough reinforcement. You know, people, uh, and there are all different kinds of reinforcement, right? And different things reinforce different people. So for another person, they go to work every day and they work their job because they know they're going to get their paycheck. And their paycheck is the thing that is reinforcing that behavior. Now, is a paycheck reinforcing? Yes, for most people. But there are some people that it's not reinforcing enough for them to go to a job. And it doesn't matter how big of the paycheck is, it might be that they need praise. So the thing that I want us all to remember is that reinforcement is very personal, very personal. Um, I, you know, I always like to use the example of angry birds because I just don't like angry birds. I just don't, it's not my thing. It feels like work to me. Um, and my son and my husband were really into it for a while and they'd go, oh, you know, I just can't get past this level and can you help me? And, you know, and I would look at it and go, oh, this is work. Why would you spend time on this? I just don't enjoy it. But I'll happily sit and play Sudoku and while away an hour playing Sudoku. And I know people who are like, are are you doing math? What is wrong with you? Uh, you know? So it's very, very personal what reinforces us. And it's very personal to individuals who are on the spectrum what reinforces them. So we need to have this idea in our head that something will reinforce them. We have to figure out what it is, and then we have to give them a reinforcer for doing things that we want to see more of. But the main thing that I want you to remember um, for, for just a minute is that don't assume that you know what the reinforcer is, especially with our little kids. They, um, they have something called a preference assessment, more jargon, uh, where they check to see what are they more drawn to. Um, and it's so important that we do those things and we do them on an often enough. Like you might think to yourself, I know my son loves video games. He loves video games. And so I tend to offer that up as a reinforcer a lot. But you know what? I got to check in every once in a while because there are times when I don't and I'll say, well, you know what? If you do X, Y, and Z, then I'm going to give you time to play a video game. And he'll go, mm, no, uh, no, I'm not. No, no, thanks anyway. No, 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 I'm not doing it. And I think, ooh, okay, that's not reinforcing enough. And then I can, I, my, because my son has progressed enough, I can now say to him, all right, what do you want to work for then? What is it that would make it worthwhile for you to do this thing that's really, you know, that book report that you really don't want to do? What would make it worth your while to get an A on that? And then he'll tell me. And by the way, sometimes we are, you know, we'll say, oh, well, this is what would reinforce me when in fact it isn't. There have been all kinds of studies done on the fact that people say, I need to make more money, but frequently employers find that people want more flexibility or they want time off and that that is actually more reinforcing to them, meaning it causes them to do the behavior that the employer wants to see than getting a paycheck. Mm, interesting, right? So don't assume that you know what a reinforcer is. But you are constantly looking for what is enough reinforcement to make this behavior happen. I talk about it all the time on the show that behaviors that happen over and over and over again have some sort of reinforcement happening for them. Um, and if we want to create a behavior that's happening over and over and over again, we have to give it meaningful reinforcement. All right, moving on, we always have a question of the day for you. Our question today, and we're just putting the jargon right out there, what is your favorite reinforcer? What's the thing that motivates you to do more things in your life than anything else? And I got to say uh, that I, I, I would guess uh, that if we were to graph what actually makes me reinforced, certainly I love to help people, right? But finding out more about how I can help my son big on my list of things to do. Big, big, big. Um, that's really reinforcing to me. What about you, though? What's your favorite reinforcer? And of course, you can tell by looking at me that food is very reinforcing to me. <laughs> I wish that exercise were more reinforcing to me. I know people that are more uh, reinforced by exercise than by food. I just am not one of them at this moment in time. Uh, in any case, moving on, we always have a topic for the week. 
week, and our topic this week has been back to basics. Going back to the main principles of ABA, applied behavior analysis, and talking about, because you know what, I always say that the, what, how I've come to think of ABA is that it's a toolkit. It's a toolkit, and it's really important to know which tools are in your toolkit and what they do, right? Because then once you know which, which thing does which thing, then you can get creative, right? But you're always using the same tools. Uh, and so it's, this has you know, been our sort of refresher of let's go over what some of the tools are, how we get compliance, and uh, how, how we use reinforcement, and um, many other things that we've talked about. We talked about the four usual suspects this week uh, of, of challenging behavior. So for today, we've got a big, exciting show for you planned uh, today. We have Dr. Del Nadowski is going to be with us. And I have on here giving and fading reinforcers. And she and I already spoke this morning, and that's incorrect. Uh, what's correct is saying thinning reinforcers, so and thinning reinforcement. So already I've learned something today. We will do a check-in on some autism news this morning, some rather disturbing things that uh, we have to share with you. And then in the second hour, we have Gina Peters, Gina Giambi Peters, uh, I, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, who is the founder of Center for Special Needs. They've got a, they've got a very wonderful mission and uh, an incredible conference that's coming up, the ABCs and XYZs of Special Needs. You're going to want to hear more about it. So we've got that, plus all the things that you guys write in after these messages. Stick with us. Skills is an online program that provides assessment, curriculum, positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior, and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The Skills Assessment and Curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes Skills the only ABA-based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self-management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. Skills is a four-step system. Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The skills assessment is the only ABA-based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions, or simply type in a keyword find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step 3. Choose activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step 4. Start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, and edit an activity status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The Skills Language Curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, tax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills. Progress starts here. What is autism? 
What is autism? What is autism? What is autism? What is autism? What is autism? What is autism? <laughs> I've been asking myself that for a very, very long time. Um, let me think about that one. <laughs> um, trying to, uh, just, um... Jeez. Let me think. <laughs> Oh man, that's a great one. Yes. Uh, autism. Uh, uh. Autism is a neurological disorder that affects many of our kids in different ways. It's a learning disability that affects the cognitive functions of the brain. A lot of people have the misconception that it's a disability, and it's really not. I look at it as like a special gift. When one person thinks differently from another, it's an opportunity for everyone to learn to understand someone that's a little different than them. Autism is the ability to educate. They're given. So much talent in different areas. To me, autism means a chance to be with and be around people you really care about. Autism is beautiful. It's a way of seeing the world differently. It's always unique, totally intelligent, and sometimes mysterious. Happiness that, that, that comes out of my um, son's um, hard work. It's a movement. Unpredictable. That's, That's right. right. Awesome. Love. The field I want to work in. Laughter. Fun. Joy. Autism is beautiful to me. I want you to remember these three words. There is hope. Welcome back to Autism Live. We have with us right now Dr. Adele Nadowski. And we so love when she's here. We call this Real Progress with Dr. Adele. Dr. Adele is one of the co-creators of Skills, and she is somebody who works with individuals who are on the autism spectrum. So welcome. We love having you here on Thursdays. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I will mention this, that we don't have Dr. Adele next Thursday. Oh, yeah, I forgot uh, yes, about that. I, I'm keeping track this time because usually I forget and go what do you mean but she was so good to give me prior notice uh, but we have a do we do have another guest that's going to be here um, next Thursday who's going to give us 10 tips for play dates with it's an uh, OT the pocket OT Kara Kaczynski 10 tips for how to have a play date with a neurotypical child and a child on the spectrum I can't cool. wait isn't that a great topic yeah I like that pocket OT yeah that's what uh, that's what they call her and she has a book that's called the pocket OT so that you can carry it with you uh, She's very it's a clever. Very, it is, isn't that? Yeah. Um, but in any case, right now we have Dr. Del Nadowski with us, and we're thrilled that she's here. She helps us to get to the good stuff, and that's the thing that I always want. She has been so instrumental in my education and being a better parent, so I'm always grateful that she's here. And I asked today if we could talk about fading reinforcement, and I've already told them that we, you've already instructed me. Uh, I already learned something today that we don't call it fading reinforcement. We call it thinning yeah okay now is there a reason why we call it thinning as opposed to fading or that just is what it is well because it's about how um, they call it thick versus thin because okay. it's a schedule of reinforcement okay so um, it's just the amount you know okay. that you're delivering it or whatever right. as opposed to like a prompt or something is reduced over time in terms of like um, it's I guess how you do it. Okay. It's still the same reinforcer, okay. but just delivered on a different schedule. Okay. I because mean, I don't really know if that's really the reason behind it, but a lot of people say fading out reinforcement. I hear that all the time. Okay. Yeah. So okay. it's pretty commonly. Okay. But the proper thing is to say thinning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I like to be proper. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and it's, it's interesting because a lot of people, when, for parents, when we come into the world of ABA, and it's a different way of looking things. It's really a shift of consciousness into looking at things in a different way, looking at behavior in a different way, looking at what our child's doing in a different way. And this whole idea of reinforcement, and that was our jargon today, so we've already gone over that a little bit. Mm -hmm. But giving reinforcement, I have to say, it's always a little bit of a pause, and I think it takes a while to get parent buy-in because we think, when we see it, there's something that looks weird about it, and we get afraid that we're we're going to be rewarding the child for absolutely every breath that they take, and that the child is only going. And you know, it's such a ridiculous argument to begin with, because right. if we did, if we spent our whole life rewarding them for every breath they took, that would be so much better than the challenging behavior we're currently in, and yet it feels so foreign to us. Right. I don't know why that is. I think we've all been taught 
and brought up, and I think there's something cellular that we go, you know, we have to punish and we have to whatever, that it, the flip of it looks so weird. <laughs> yeah, it's true. People are very used to punishment, although I'm seeing a lot more these days especially now that um, people are not really doing spankings as much with their mm -hmm. children, that people are really doing these um, reinforcement systems. And I see it a lot in school settings and classrooms, for example. And the kids love it. Yeah. Well, they're so excited because they get to have some sort of um, treasure on Friday kind of thing. And it, I mean, they're yeah. waiting all week to try to, yeah. to do well so that they can do that. Yeah, and, and, and we see that it works, that it's yeah. much more effective than punishment. I mean, if ever, if ever people were really to sit down and look at how much more effective it is, we'd have to rethink the prison system. Um, but we, we would, our, our word earlier this week was antecedent. So, so if we look at things before people get to the point where they have to be in prison, if we're giving them enough reinforcement, maybe we wouldn't get to that. Exactly. Right? Uh, big ideas here. But so... For, for people, and I have been one of these people as well, for people who are concerned about, well, it just seems like I'm going to be praising a whole lot and I'm going to be giving reinforcement and that seems foreign, the idea that if we can get behind the idea of thinning it, maybe they can get excited about it is my thought. Yeah, and the truth of the matter is, is um, we all only behave because of the consequences that we get. So we do things either to get something good or to avoid something bad, basically. Right. And unfortunately in life, a lot of like what we do at work and things like that is to avoid bad consequences. We don't want to get in trouble with our boss or be late on a deadline and disappoint people and, and those things matter. But a lot of those are social reinforcers as well and they're more learned. So when kids are younger, um, they need to still actually care about that. Yes. And there's a point in time when they really don't get it and they don't care. And so um, the actual reinforcers that we use need to be tangible things, highly preferred things. And um, over time, they will learn uh, the social consequences, and those can maintain behavior eventually. Okay. So, so as part of the whole reinforcement thing, putting it on so thick, is because we want them to care about what we're teaching them? Well, and we want them to learn it, and we want to increase it. So... Yeah. Um, we have to have lots of practice opportunities and we have to reinforce on a regular schedule. So we start with a continuous schedule usually, okay. which means every time they engage in the appropriate behavior, they're given the reinforcer. Okay. Um, and then that strengthens that behavior. That behavior will then increase. It's not reinforcement unless the behavior is actually increasing. Okay. okay so can so, you give a specific example of something that you might give on a continuous reinforcement basis? Well, you know, when we first start out with some of our kids, um, actually, if they don't respond at all to any social consequences, then we do have to start a lot of times with either edibles or highly preferred toys and objects. Yeah. So. Okay, so imagine that you've got, because uh, I always like to take examples at different places, because I know our viewers in different places. Imagine that somebody's got a three-year-old um, that is not yet verbal, and they're just starting out ABA. And they're trying to figure out what would reinforce this child. And maybe one of the first lessons that they're working on is compliance, I would think. That yes. would probably be something in the beginning. Yep. Um, and, you know, it might be getting them to come here, let's exactly, say. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, what if you're working with a three-year-old, what do you do to find out what will reinforce that three-year-old? Well, first I start off with um, interviewing the parents. And I go through a bunch of different categories to try to get them to think of what they're they think their child likes the most. So and I'm you're like, never looking for just one thing, right? You want to no. know as many things as you can figure out, no, right? No, I want to have like an entire inventory of things. Okay. Um, and so to get the parents, you know, to think that way, it's good to have questions that are more um, pointed in a certain direction instead okay. of just like open-ended. So instead of just saying, what are things your child really likes? We would say something like, what are some things that um, he's seems to like that are more visual? Okay. What does he like, like auditory? Okay. What does he like to touch? Um, what, and then with foods, like maybe what are, what, uh, are the most preferred foods, or we might even go into the food groups maybe to find out, to okay. get specifics. Okay. Um, and what are you willing to let us give him during sessions? Good because, point. you know, yes, I've candy been one, I, I've not been one of those parents. Be We've had this conversation allowed. before that I, you know, there were things that I said, no, I don't want you giving him that, um, you know, I, I want to, I really wanted to, be, I did allow some food reinforcers. I have been reminded, uh, that for instance, my, my son loved hot dogs. And, uh, so when it got, would get to be around lunchtime, I allowed for cut up hot dogs to be used as a reinforcer. And he loved that. 
Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's assume yeah. that you got the child who loves hot dogs. The parents have said, and I said that he loves hot dogs and he loves Buzz Lightyear and, you know, he loves potato chips. Right, and there's going to be some families who say, I don't, he doesn't like any toys. Right. And that a lot of times has to do with the fact that they don't know how to play with toys appropriately, yes. so they're just not interested. Um, but, like, with one of the first kids I ever worked with, um, we had the parents go to the actual toy store and just hang out with their kid and just ha see what they kind of gravitate towards. And we had them actually buy a bunch of things in the very beginning. And a lot of them were just like little sense, like what you would consider more of sensory kind of toys. Yeah. They don't really do anything except maybe like they feel squishy. Yeah, like a cushion. Or they ball. light up. Yeah. Or they spin or something like that. And yeah. it might be something where it just provides them some sort of like visual or auditory um, stimulation, basically. And so now we've identified all these and we have them and we um, keep them aside for just during therapy sessions. Right. So we're not going to be giving them freely when we're not there. Yeah, because if the kid if the kid loves the little thing that lights up and spins and you let them play with it all the time, then, you know, they're not going to work as hard to get it because it's something that they've had all the time. Right. It's the same thing asking somebody after they've had a huge piece of chocolate cake, would you like more cake? Right. Not now. And so a lot of times, like, um, if therapy, let's say, is happening all day, then um, during normal snack times and stuff like that, mom might bring in a plate of strawberries or goldfish or whatever, pretzels. It doesn't have to be yeah. candy, per se, as long as it's highly preferred. And um, we'll just give little bites um, on a yeah. continuous schedule and initially. And we do use, um, eventually we start using differential reinforcement, which means we're not going to give it on a continuous schedule for every um, response that we have to prompt. Right. So now it's like, okay, only if they do it independently, then they're going to get the reinforcer. Yeah. So it doesn't look like every single time, but it looks like every independent time. Does okay. that make sense? Yes. Okay. And then um, with the toys and such... Um, We'll do little, and also with the food, first we might do a preference assessment. So we try to do those regularly, yeah. right before every new kind of transition or of a new activity. And with a three-year-old, what does a preference assessment it's look like? It's very simple and easy. Um, there's some very um, formal preference assessments out there, but when you're doing therapy all day long with a child, it's quite simple to just take three to five items and lay them out. Or if you have a bag or a box or whatever right. full of items, and lay them out and um, tell them to pick one. Yeah. Or if they don't even understand that, just put them out and whatever they yeah. grab toward is the one. And then um, we would pick them up and move them around just to make sure they saw them all. Right. And then ask them again. Yeah. And then maybe do that a third time. And whatever they went to the most, you know, usually if there's one thing they want, they'll go to that all three times or two out of three times or something. Yeah. That becomes the one that we use as the reinforcer. I'm going to take a break, and then we're going to come back and talk about this a little bit, because I think that this is one of the things that if parents can really understand, it makes such a difference. Because parents, we see therapists do this, and therapists do this like a magic trick. It looks like a carnival game, and they make it fun, <laughs> and then we go to do it, and it, it we, we start a tantrum. So I want to talk about what some of the fine points are of doing that, because uh, honestly, I think it's where a lot of parents get hung up. So let's take a break, and then we're going to come back and talk a little bit more in depth about the preference assessment, but we will get to the thinning. I think this is all very valid. Though. Okay. All right, stick with us. Looking for some cheap, festive napkins for your next party with your kids? Look no further. We're going to be making some hand-dyed paper napkins. While we make this fun activity, you'll notice that these icons will pop up. These icons tell you important information about the skill and where to find it on the Skills program. Skills is an ABA-based online tool that helps parents create curriculum to help teach their children on the autism spectrum. And if you're already a Skills user, this will ensure that you get the most out of this fun activity with your child. Well, let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are paper towels, food coloring, water, a bowl, and rubber bands. Step one, you're going to take your paper towel and you're going to fold it symmetrically into a shape. This is a chance to be creative to see how repeating patterns are going to be made. Once your paper towels have been folded into different types of shapes and patterns, you're going to take your rubber band and you're going to use that to secure it in place. These are my folded up napkins. Now that they're ready, I'm going to take my water and mix it up with the food coloring and submerge the napkins in it. Once they've been submerged with the food coloring, I'm going to take it out and lay it flat to dry. If you leave it in the water too long, they're going to completely disintegrate, so just leave them in for just a moment. 
I've been very patient and here is my finished pattern napkin. Well, I hope you enjoyed this activity with me today. Until next time guys, craft on. Bye. To find more about skills and to access all of the lessons you saw in today's Smarty, visit skillsforautism.com and click on the parents icon, Skills, the online autism solution. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're here with Dr. Adele Nadowski. We call this segment Real Progress with Dr. Adele. We've asked her to talk about thinning reinforcement, but in talking about how we set these circumstances up, we, we were talking a little bit about the preference assessment. And I brought up one of the things that still evades me a little bit, because it's like a magic trick, and I, I, I want your input on it. When a therapist sits down and they do a preference assessment, and you were saying, you know, three to five things, and I laid a couple of things out here, a blue pen, a white pen, and a, and a glue stick. And and, and so I know I, I need to get real toys here to, <laughs> to have. But anyway, so the, the, we wait to see which one the child goes to pick up. They pick up the glue stick. Now, what, what becomes hard for parents is that now the child either either they've reached for it or they want it. And now we need to get it back so that we can move these things around to have them pick again. And if they pick the glue stick again, we need to get the glue stick and set it aside so that the child knows if you do the next thing, you're going to get this as the reinforcement therapists do this and it and it looks all fun and the child is all happy smiles and everything is wonderful parents do it and we're not quick enough or we're too nervous about how we do it um, but it feels like we're taking it away from the child and teasing them with it and I have never seen a therapist do it that it looks or feels that way to the child yeah but anytime I've tried to do it I feel self-conscious about it and I don't know whether it's just the way I'm feeling but give us the secret for well. What, what it is you do right so that we'll know what we're doing wrong. When we first lay the items out and then they choose one, you can let them play with it for a few seconds and okay. you can play with them with it. So okay. if it was the glue, then I might pick up the glue and but we'll pretend this is a spinny toy or something. And right. like, oh, you like the spinny toy and press the button and we both go, ah, awesome. Yeah. And then I just quickly move the stuff. Okay. And then I go, I pick think so. one. And then they get it right away again. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, the other thing, though, I would say is that they probably aren't too happy at first with the therapist taking the stuff away, but they also learn very quickly how, that they're going to get it back. Yeah. So maybe it's just a matter of not repeating, repeated exposure with you doing that as a parent. You don't okay. do it all the time. So we need to hang out and do it more often. Probably, yeah. And I do think that what will come with doing it more often is that we will get more confident that we know what we're doing and we'll be able to do it faster and you know do it with because i think speed is part of it and i think that the way you guys handle yourselves and that you're totally calm and you're totally focused on the child and not self-conscious about it and spinning things and playing with them i think you yeah. know what's going to happen and the child feels that <laughs> Whereas with the parents, you know, we're like, oh, I don't really know what I'm doing. And the child is a little, feeling a little at sea as well. Perhaps, yeah. But I think that if you were to do it a few More. times, yeah, they would get okay. quite used to that. Plus, there's a different uh, uh, interaction between a child and their parent. That's true. You know, um, there's more baggage on the table. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the truth. And there's baggage underneath the table, and it's parked by the door because we have baggage, good and bad baggage, with our kids. We we don't like it when they're uncomfortable. We don't like to see them be unhappy, and they know how to push our buttons. Our kids are bright. Yeah. Um, and with you guys, you come in and it's a clean slate, and you've already dealt with 35 million kids, so that you know <laughs> they're not going to push your buttons. And I think they get that too. Yeah. Uh, all right, so you do the preference assessment, and part of the key is that you 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 don't just this. I, and I we all need to remind ourselves that we should be doing preference assessments more often, because we as human beings, what we want at ten o'clock changes at ten fifteen, mm -hmm. and and the fact that we don't allow our kids to change their minds about that is not good. Right. Okay. So yeah, it's very important. So just like voting, frequent and, <laughs> right? What's the thing that they say about vote often and frequently? <laughs> preference assessments. Early and often, uh, Kelby tells me. So early and often on the preference assessments. Uh, okay, so we, we're doing the preference assessment. Now we've identified for this moment in time that the glue stick is more reinforcing than the blue pen and the white pen. It's more preferred. We don't really know if it's reinforcing until we ah. use it as a consequence and see if it increases the behavior. Right, because we may think it's the most reinforcing thing in the world and the child picked it, but if it doesn't make the behavior happen more often, it's not really a reinforcer. Yeah, and remember, preference is all relative to the other items on the table. So if you put a bunch of non-preferred items on the table, they're going to pick the most 
or the least <laughs> right. non preferred, I guess. But the truth is, <laughs> it may not be power or not powerful enough to be a reinforcer. It in could. which case, you got to go back to the drawing board. Possibly, yeah. Okay. So think about that. When your child is not responding and you're going, what's happening? Why aren't they getting it? It could be a lot of reasons. Um, but one of those possible reasons is that this isn't functioning as a reinforcer. Okay. Yeah, because there there are things that, you know, I, I, if you want me to jump off of a building, you could offer me a million dollars, which in a whole lot of other circumstances, it would be reinforcing enough. But to jump off of a building, I don't think so. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, so so we've picked something that we think is preferred, and we're, we're now going to ask the individual to do something. And if they do it properly, they're going to get this reinforced. Yes. And um, we have like two different kinds of things we might be working on with a child at any given time. Okay. Either it's something on acquisition, which means it's something they haven't learned yet and they're learning it right now. Mm -hmm. So it's new. Or it's something they already know and we say it's on maintenance. If it's on maintenance, that means we're just trying to make sure it maintains and they don't lose that skill over time. Okay. So we're not going to be providing a reinforcer on a continuous schedule, meaning every single time they do a maintenance skill. Okay. Right. Because we should have already thinned out the reinforcement on those skills. Okay. But when we're doing acquisition, it's brand new, we're going to be providing reinforcement on a continuous schedule initially. So okay. every single time they engage in that behavior, and even in the very beginning, we use a lot of um, errorless learning. So we might um, provide them with a prompt that's going to ensure they get it correct, and then we're going to still give them the reinforcer. Right. Because it's brand new, and they have no clue what we're doing yet. Yeah. And then as we're able to start to fade out that prompt, so n maybe I'm having to give like full prompts, and now I'm giving partial prompts, um, I might still continue to give the reinforcer on a continuous schedule, mm -hmm. and I would actually... Um, not change that up until they're responding like a hundred percent to like a least intrusive kind of prompt at which point then I might no longer provide on a continuous schedule the reinforcement for prompted behaviors and okay. only independent responses okay and it's all an understand? art though there is no like particular rule or way you right. have to do this this is not spelled out and there isn't really even necessarily research to support you know exactly how we should fade out prompts and all this kind of stuff unfortunately this because is so nitpicky and idiosyncratic across children it differs yes. so yeah well the, the children differ the individuals differ um, and, yeah. you, and you kind of have to see what you know it's like the the dog and the wagging the tail and the tail wagging the dog you kind of have to see what worked um, so it's, I was saying before, it's like having a toolbox and you got to figure out how to use the tools yeah. and use them very creatively. But just imagine reinforce, 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 even unprompted initially. And then as the kids starting to do it a little on their own, now we're not going to reinforce when yeah. they do it, um, with a prompt. Yeah. Okay. And then now we're doing reinforcement only on independent responding, but it's still on a continuous schedule for independent yeah. responding. And the kid can do it with lots of distractors and we're working on maintenance items in between and everything's great. So now we're going to start to thin out the reinforcement schedule. And the, the funny thing about this is, is that we all do this in real life all the time anyway. And we've been doing this with our kids, but now we're going to be very conscious about it. Because I, I have a friend who on Facebook just day before last, they posted a video because their son started walking for the first time. And so there was the video of him taking the first few steps and mom going, look, you're walking. And then it, it, it cut to like a day later and she was like, you're walking you're walking and then it cut to like two days later and she was like nice walking and then and then he was just walking and, and she was saying come here and she wasn't going you're walking every single time <laughs> right yes. I mean we do this in in real life when I think about when we were potty training Jem and every time he went potty in the potty we you know party hats and kazoos and stuff <laughs> right well we certainly don't do that now right uh, we just don't and there are all kinds of things in life that we you know the first you know when it's first happening that we're all excited about it and then it sort of becomes commonplace um, but we we just want to be super super conscious about this uh, now when uh, you know when, when we're working with an individual with autism because it, we're going to use it to its most effectiveness right? So yeah in the beginning when we brought this up you said some people might feel very uncomfortable because they feel like they're basically rewarding every little thing that their kid does that's not actually what we're asking you to do we don't want you to do that 
Um, you should not be rewarding every single thing. If you are, then you need to figure out what you no longer need to reward. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you should be focused on things that are on acquisition. That means the child doesn't have it solid yet. They need to still learn it. Yeah. Um, and that could be for a lot of things. It could be, oh, well, he knows it. He's learned it. It's not an issue of that, but he's not motivated to do it. Right. That still needs a reinforcer then because yeah. the natural reinforcer is not existing. Right. And that's the thing is that a lot of us do behaviors because we're motivated to do them from the natural reinforcers yeah. we get from them. If we weren't, then we'd need somebody to contrive something for us as well, you know? So. Yes. Well, and I, you know, one of the examples that came up because we were talking about compliance and come here, um, you know, people are afraid when that, when that particular lesson comes up and we go, yay, that was good coming here. They're afraid that they're going to be saying that to a 15 year old. And, and, and you don't accept that sometimes you do because sometimes a 15 year old needs to be rewarded for coming here because their circumstances change. And I, I I always like to remind people that's not a bad space to be on. If, if you're in the space where once a week when you ask your 15 year old when they're with a bunch of their friends and you say, can you come here for a second and they actually come over to you, I think it's worthwhile to say to them, hey, thank you for coming over. I, I, people say, oh, but they should just do that because, but I don't know very many 15 year olds that do that unless they've been rewarded for it. Yeah, and I like that you mentioned that because basically what you just talked about was if you just completely stop give, delivering the reinforcer, like one day you're doing it and one day you're not, Yeah, that is actually not going to help that behavior get into that maintenance phase. Yeah. You know, you have to at least still provide the reinforcer every now and then yes. in order to maintain that response. Yeah. So we call that intermittent reinforcement. So you go from a continuous schedule where you deliver it all the time and then you start thinning it out. So you might go to like every, you know, like a variable schedule where it's like around every two to three times they do something, you give it to them. Yeah. And then it may become a, a bigger uh, variable um, yeah. ratio. So to where now it's like pretty thinned out, but at least you're still giving something every now and then. Um, but, you know, a lot of times these behaviors also can be maintained by more of just the natural consequences. And I have to say, telling your 15 year old, hey, I like that you just came over here, that is a natural consequence actually. Yeah. I don't think that's necessarily contrived. Like, I genuinely feel pretty happy when my 10 year old does certain things yeah. and I'll tell him, like, yeah. you know, I'm really proud of you. Thank you for being so respectful. That was really nice how you did that, you know. But you know, there's a lot of people that's who aren't genuine. used that's to that. But there are a lot up, of people know? that feels weird to um, that because they didn't get that when they were teenagers. I think, mm. um, I, you know, I, I used to teach, and I remember teaching high school students, and we were teaching a, 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 a medieval poem about a mom telling her son how beautiful he is and how wonderful he is. And I remember the reaction of the kids saying, "Well, moms don't do that," and being physically ill and saying, what do you mean? Your moms aren't telling you that you're beautiful? Because your moms should be. And I think sometimes in our society, we've gotten into such a, you know, and I can do this sometimes with my son. I'm not trying to make it sound like I don't, where I'm like, you need to do this, stand up straight, do this. But it, you know, you get into the habit of knit, 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 uh, instead of saying, hey, I'm so proud of you. And what a better relationship we have with our kids when we say, thank you for coming over. That builds respect. Yeah, and if you don't feel comfortable saying something, you can show or provide reinforcement in other ways That's through true. like touching and stuff like that. Absolutely. So when they come over, maybe just give them like a little, you know, pat or a hug yes. or something, whatever. It's not going to act actually as a punisher if they're going to feel right. embarrassed. In well, front by of the time I, I suspect by the but, time they're 15, because Jem's 11 and a half, and, and now all of a sudden, when, around his friends, if I go to hug him or something, he's like, "Mom," <laughs> you yeah. know. But they're it, not there. It's okay. But. Yeah, it could even just be like a little, you know. Yeah. Brush on the arm yes. or something, a little squeeze or something, and that acts that way. They know that you're happy with them or whatever. Yes. But uh, um, yeah, so. Or even even the eye contact now. Jem is at a point where I can give him eye contact and just smile at him, and uh, smiling, yeah, yeah, and he gets it that you know he did something that was good, and we have that little, we have that silent communication now, which I didn't think we would ever have. That's uh, awesome. Used to be that he would say what, <laughs> <laughs> what was that for, <laughs> and now uh, now he just continues on. Anyway, we're going to take a break. We have a bunch of questions that have come in and we're going to pick at least one uh, if we have time for Dr. Nadowski to answer. So stick with us. Hi, I'm 
and Lisa Ackerman. Welcome back to Talk of Facts. Um, I, we hear questions all the time, and we want to give you the answers that help make your journey in autism easier and more navigatable. Less than a year ago, we interviewed the top 100 doctors in the United States working with children on the spectrum, and we asked them a question in the cloak of secrecy. What are the top three mistakes parents living with autism do? Number one, and my, the one that makes me laugh the most, is when they use their physician as a marriage and family therapist. <laughs> one, the doctors told me it made them uncomfortable, and two, they were highly unqualified to provide that type of advice. So the night before your physician appointment with your MAPS doctor, get together with your spouse, significant other, and write out the list of the targets and the agenda that you want to cover at the physician's appointment. Get in sync then you'll be definitely spending less time and not making that doctor so uncomfortable. Second thing that was the most common mistakes parents living with autism make is they want to go too fast. And really, you want to pace yourself in the autism journey. We all know that we want to get our kid to be the best they can be and hopefully recover from autism. And what a lot of the doctors have told me is that you want to really pace yourself, one, to let the labs be your guide and to work with your physician on the prioritization and the, the delivery of the different medical interventions. The third most common mistake they felt families made was giving up too soon. And what you need to know is they're invested, um, they're looking at wanting to get the best from your child. But I tell you that when I got that and consolidated the 100 interviews with these physicians, most of the doctors who brought that up had tears in their eyes. Um, they want you to know that they're in the fight with you and they want you to know that hope is really real. It may take hard work and it may take time, but to not give up and to stay in the game. So let TACA help you. We'll have some more TACA facts for you in the future, real questions and real answers for the autism journey. Welcome back to Autism Live. We are here with Dr. Adele Nadowski, and she's awesome. We're going to take two questions uh, fairly quickly here. So, dear Shannon, our Florida contingent, who we love, has written in with a question, says, I have a question. My daughter, very high functioning, making a lot of progress with lots of intensive ABA home and school-based for the last year and a half, is now getting used to staying at home and refuses to go out even to the park. She doesn't make a tantrum, but she says, I don't want to go out outside. I want to stay home. Even if we try different places, she is lately automatically saying that any thoughts, love you and thank you. Well, you know, we love you and we love that precious girl of yours. Uh, and I can relate. I'm, I'm not a, I like to stay home too, <laughs> so, but that's not good for a young girl. So what, what would you say to that? Dr. Nadowski? I think this one is very simple. Okay. Um, bring ABA outside. Okay. So um, you're doing ABA in the home and school, and so she's home all the time, but ABA can be done in the community, it can be done at the park, it can be done in the backyard. We've had some kids where we spend the entire session in the backyard doing water play and trampoline, and all those things are the things we use as the reinforcers, and we intermix all the teaching. Um, but if you want to get beyond that, um, they can go to um, places that you guys eat, they can go to parks nearby, whatever. Some of our therapists go with the parents on their errands and whatever yeah. they're doing, and they do therapy out in the community. Okay, and then do we need to like make sure that there's some really reinforcing things to get her outside to get started doing that? Absolutely. Okay, so pull out the big stops for the, and, and maybe those things aren't available inside for a while, they're only available outside for a while till we get her used to going back outside? Yeah, I think that um, she'll, once she starts to get outside, She's gonna, She's like, gonna it. like it. Yeah. Okay. It is. It's a, it's a great big world out there. Okay. Long question, and I might edit it down a little bit. Uh, but uh, somebody writes in and says, "Hi, thank you for your show. My son is almost five years, uh, almost five, starting to get really frustrated with certain writing activities, like writing his name. I feel a lot of it is because he's at a typical preschool. They have seat work there. The first thing they do is write their name. At school and at home, we encourage effort versus final product. But he doesn't like to be corrected." 
infected and has meltdowns with lots of crying. Uh, yesterday, it happened with my OT. She feels it's the school pushing him too much to be independent and not ask for help. Uh, she, and he did have a little bit of a meltdown yesterday. The OT did not want her to come into the room right away because she said he will uh, learn to cry and call my name when he gets frustrated. I didn't go into the room right away, but once he calmed down, I did go in and hugged him and tried to use it for him as an opportunity to use his words that he was frustrated and validated him that it is a tough task, but just to try to do his best and it's okay to ask for help. But she continues to say, what should I, uh, how should I handle when he cries, when he gets frustrated with others and myself? How do I help him with social emotional regulation as he gets frustrated and has meltdowns Two, also when we run out of something or his favorite toy breaks? And does skills have a lesson for that? So um, mainly the social emotional regulation, which we could okay. all use, right? Yes. <laughs> Um, but let me first address the handwriting issue. Um, you need to set him up for success. So whatever he's being demanded of him, he feels is too much. And maybe there's also not enough reinforcement available for doing it. So um, that would mean maybe making the task easier. So I don't know if he's having to copy things that he's writing right now. You might want to go to tracing. Um, also, uh, you can go to use what I, we call demand fading. This is where you only provide one demand initially, and then you get the reinforcer right away. Okay. So maybe um, start with an easier letter as well. So like L or something is pretty easy because it's just straight lines. And um, after writing maybe only one letter, he can get access to a reinforcer. And showing that he can do that maybe then across a line or three letters or whatever, but you slowly increase what you're requiring of him and also slowly increase the letters. So start with the easy ones. Handwriting Without Tears is an excellent program and it tells you which letters to start with that are the easiest and they have some cool activities that go with it that also make it more fun. So like you could use like construction paper that's colored, let's say, let's say he loves green put um, shaving cream on it mm -hmm. and then he can play and make the letters in the shaving mm -hmm. cream so that's more of a fun game more the task itself is kind of more mm -hmm. reinforcing um, there's also apps um, little writers I really like where um, it actually teaches them to do the writing and they can either use their finger or a stylus so a stylus might be good since he needs to write with a pencil or a mm -hmm. pen at school and it's nice because kids love uh, technology, so and they're not going to feel like someone's correcting them, but uh, it does correct them. So when they're writing, if they don't do it correctly, then it won't let them continue, mm -hmm. so they have to fix it kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, I think those kind of things and lots of reinforcement could help a lot with the writing. Absolutely. Um, for emotional... Get the school on board, though. Get the school yeah. on board. May, you know, ask for an IEP meeting or a meeting with the teacher to say, hey, you know, we need to take this back a step and this is how we're going to work on it. We need you to do that, too. Get them on board so that they're not just frustrating him when he's at school. Exactly. Um, and then for the emotional self-control, we do have a lesson. It's called emotional self-control and it's in skills. Um, it's in the executive functions curriculum. And um, it, there are some strategies and things that you can teach um, them to use when they get in these um, times where they're feeling extremely angry, like they're about to explode. Mm -hmm. um, one of them, I don't remember, I think you said he's in preschool. One of them um, that I think kids his age really like is something called rocket breaths. And it's where you literally just have them go like, <laughs> I don't really necessarily want to do this on camera, but <laughs> um, breathe in. Uh -huh. and do like three rocket breaths or something like that um, instead of the tantrum behavior that okay. they would normally do. And a lot of kids actually really enjoy it and it kind of calms them and makes them feel good in the moment. Absolutely. So yeah. that's one example, but there's many other things as well. And we have visual banks and things where we can, um, first of all, we'll teach them all the different strategies and then we use the visual bank for them to be able to choose one and we can do like, um, depending on how, um, much he understands language and stuff, you guys can role play in advance of what he's going to do in these situations and provide reinforcement during the role plays and then start contriving, you know, the situations, but in moments where they're going to be less heated yes. first, where he can actually be successful, yeah. and then we just build up to the more... Um, emotionally charged situations later okay and we and we reinforce when they use, the, use emotional control the strategies yeah okay wonderful I mean obviously one thing too is just teaching him to um, make requests of what it is he needs so whatever a lot of times when they're getting really heated like that it's that they need something they might just need a break they might need help and so we're gonna teach those replacement behaviors as well 
um, of asking, can you help me, or this is too hard, or something like that as well. I gotta say, too, that uh, not only is this great for our kids on the autism spectrum, um, but it's great for everyone. That uh, my son went through all of this, and there are there have been times when he had, we've been in a situation, and he has said, I'm feeling very frustrated right now. Um, and I think that you're feeling very frustrated right now, and that I was not able to language what was happening right then, <laughs> right? And you look at your kid, and you go, I'm sorry, who are you and why are you parenting me? <laughs> right? But it's exciting because if we can give those kinds of skills for them to be able to have that, and remember, my child was a child who wasn't speaking, and if we can give them the ability to communicate, to understand what they're feeling, and the ability to communicate what they're feeling, I can't wait to see who he grows up to be. Does uh, he do that um, basically to say, like, I'm feeling frustrated and you're feeling frustrated. Let's not do this anymore right now until we calm down kind of thing. Depending on what the circumstances. Oh, okay. I can think of one thing that we did. It was probably like six months ago where we were out on a Saturday and I pushed the envelope. You know that thing of, well, if we just go to one more place, even though I know it's already lunchtime and we don't have lunch with us. Oh, yeah, when us, people are hungry, they get angry. Right. <laughs> and so I pushed it. I was like, we just need to go one more place. And then it took too long. And then we came home and everybody was hungry. Everybody was tired and everybody was just sort of being crabby with each other, my husband and my son and I. And Jem was the one who said, hey guys, it's way past lunchtime. I think we're all a little tired. I think we're all a little crabby. I think we should eat lunch before we do anything else. And I just went and hugged him. I was like, <laughs> look at how adult and mature you are. Your father and I just would have been like <laughs> in the corner. Um, you're kind of amazing. Look at you. And he was all grins because I was hugging him and saying, and he's like, well, you know, I sensed that you're very frustrated, <laughs> I know I am. And, and I was thinking, you know, don't you want to see who he dates later on in life? Um, because I, you know, I, do, I wasn't raised with these kinds of skills, nor was my husband. Um, it's so really cool. good. And they, and it also, they, it, it spreads to other things. I watched my son doing a presentation with a, a neurotypical kid in his classroom who was being a bit of a butthead, I'm just gonna say. And the teacher had said several times to the other child, you need to, you know, share the presentation thing and eventually my son gave up and I was a little disappointed in that and I said to him afterwards I said you know you need to advocate for yourself and he wasn't giving you an opportunity to speak and an opportunity to hold the thing you need to and he said mom you know it's really important to him to be in charge of things and sometimes he said it really <laughs> wasn't as important to me and sometimes you have to let people do what they have to do <laughs> Bless your By the way, soul. you just reminded me of something um, that I noticed myself that I've been mm -hmm. doing more at home with my kids, uh -huh. is that when they're making me really frustrated and upset, uh -huh. I'm telling them, I'm saying, like, you guys, yes. I'm starting to get really upset right now, so you need to, like, stop yes. what you're doing. Uh, and and that's, a powerful, like... that's a powerful thing for any of us <laughs> to language what we're feeling to the other people in the room gives them an opportunity to change their behavior. Yeah. And there's a lesson in skills that helps kids to know that they can, that their behavior can change the, the variable of what's happening. And yes, I think, you know, what a great, great thing that you say. Yeah. Because I'm not perfect, obviously. I can stand, sit on the show and talk, but when you're an actual parent, which I know, um, it's way different than when you're doing dealing with yes. someone else's kids. I can be calm all all day long with someone else's, but then I'm going to go home and it's going to be really hard for me, and I have to wow. practice. Being and there's that baggage. Honest. There's that baggage that yes. we bring with us whenever we're. With so our kids. I've yelled. I've done things like that, and so no. now all I have to do is say, "I'm getting really <laughs> upset right now," and they're like, "Uh oh, <laughs> the so yelling funny. person is about to show up here." That's well. It's <laughs> funny because I have now started saying to Jem, uh, you know that you can keep pushing this and that we will get to the point where I will yell. You know that will come, right? <laughs> so we're about here on the mom's about to yell, do you want to change something? And usually now he's old enough, that would never have worked when he was three. He, you know, that, that could not have happened. He would have been in the corner not making eye contact with me. So there's a place and a time where that can come. So but you can get there. The yelling bothers me so much, though. Like, when oh, I do I it, I feel so upset with myself yeah. afterwards. So I actually started something totally new, which What's is that? I, like, practically, not whisper, but I talk really, really low. So, but for some reason, that makes it better for me. Yeah. So I'll be like, you know what? I do not like what you're doing right now. You need to go in your room and sit there for the next whatever many minutes, you know, whatever. And they're just kind of like... Because it's not like a normal voice. Yes. 
it still seems to have an effect without yelling. Right. But you don't have to feel bad about yourself but I'm talking afterwards. Really, really low. Good for you. You're just like two weeks away from the "I'm very disappointed in you" conversation, and we all know how that goes. Uh, but you know, these if if it's something that makes a difference to the child, it's not going to make a difference with all children. But if it does make a difference, uh, what a wonderful thing to do the whispery voice instead. I'm trying that out tonight. Uh, it works really well for some reason for me personally. Yeah. To calm myself while I'm feeling super angry or whatever and well, I want and to be screaming. Well, it's effective, too. Yeah, I just change my behavior some way and it just, I don't know. Right. Try it. Tell me how that it That may work because, you know, my, my son doesn't like it when I yell when I'm excited, even. He never, since he came out of the womb, does not like the sound of my voice being loud. And I'm a loud person. It makes for a very difficult time. Anyway, thank you so much for being with You're us. Welcome. All kinds of great ideas about reinforcing uh, and great ideas for these folks who wrote in questions. We're way past time, and I apologize for going over, but we're going to go right now to the A Word, the ongoing documentary that's being made by the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, following a little boy, Jack Riley, who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. We get to have a window into his family life to see what it's like having an intensive behavioral intervention in his home. He's got a growing family. He's got a baby sister. He's a big brother now. So we'll get to take a look at some of the things that they're dealing with this week. When we come back, we have our special guest, Gina Peters, is with, here with us from Center for Special Needs. We're going to be talking about a really wonderful event that she has coming up, the ABCs and XYZs of special needs. I think you're going to love hearing about it. But first, here is the A word. I know a cute little blue-eyed boy, and his name is Jack. Jack Riley. He got a big, warm, blue-eyed soul that makes your heart beat fast. I sing Jack, Jack, Jack is my buddy. Jack, Jack, Jack is my buddy. Everybody around is so down with Jack. Hi, Diana. Hi. Where are you looking at? Is this Diana? Hi, Jack Riley. How are you? Jack Riley has been in preschool for a few days now with Jessica as his shadow. Today, his team needs to discuss how school is going, such as how Jack Riley's behaviors have been and how his teacher is handling him and what they can do to help. The first two days, I was kind of feeling her out because she, she's actually new to teaching. Yeah. So I just made her a little bit nervous. I was telling her, you know, it's always, it's always okay to raise questions for your behavior. Like, yeah. Don't forget to do that. Yeah. So I was showing her a lot with other kids as well as him. Looks like there's room for growth. She just seems to kind of, is trying to get into the whole hang of preschool. But I just reminded her like why I'm there. It's just the leaving myself out and have you take over. Yes. How much are you able to back off and let him kind of do his thing? Like Outside play, pretty much 90% of the time. Awesome. So it's just the play. It's just the, <laughs> the tantrums. What's what's evoking the tantrums? It was um, snack time. Because they, they provide a snack at school, and yesterday it was like bagels and cream cheese with like diced pears, and he wanted neither. But instead of saying, hey, I don't want that, he started to flip out. And then um, I reminded him he had goldfish, he just has to use words like, appropriately. Good job. Um, and then after that, he wanted milk. But he didn't have yep, milk. you're almost done with the level. Okay. So um, <coughs> Look, he got really, really upset, like and then he felt <laughs> that if he screamed it louder, he would get it. <laughs> so that's because he didn't have it. So I told him once, and then it still wasn't okay. I had to pull him out because the other kids were getting a little bit uneasy. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to direct the issue to him. Mm -hmm. So I let him have it out outside oh, for two day minutes. After he calmed down, I just told him, I just told him, you know, we don't have it. So either drink water or drink out That's just what we have. How are you? And he was fine after that. If you're saying that as like a reoccurring thing, then you begin just to teach them the rule. You know, if they don't have what you want, you say, you know, oh, I wish they had milk, but okay. You know, teach them the replacement okay. thing to say. And then we'll take data on uh, in vivo. Is he able to use the replacement behavior that we've taught? What did you have for snack yesterday at school? What was there? But you didn't like it. What was there? Do you remember? Peaches. peaches. Okay. And peaches are good. What peaches else? And peaches are... Uh, are peaches good for me? I love peaches. I think they're so good. And they're very good for you. They have lots of vitamins. I, want I don't like them. Yeah. That's okay. You can just say, I don't like peaches. So you give the roll, okay. have him practice, and then we'll take data on if he's able to implement the roll. Should I be packing him? A juice, a juice box? And mm -hmm. No. Well, I think it's good to have him kind of mm -hmm. be okay with if it's not there, it's not there. As much as you can fade back, fade back. 
Only oh. jump in during those times of you really need to. He really needs you so we can. So if I say, tell me about a dog, and then you would have to say, a dog has fur, it has a long tail, and four legs. Okay? Okay? So I'm going to ask you something. Tell me three things about Steven. He's a teacher? He just came from his back cave. He came from his back cave? And he doesn't live on a street. And he what? And he doesn't live on a street. And he doesn't live on a street? Okay, I'll take it. Tell me three things about a kitty cat. A kitty cat just the animal and the animal, uh -huh. and, and it's somebody's pet. And it's somebody's pet. And 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 Squally has one. And and Squally has a dog. No, so you, it's a pet, it's an animal, and it's and it's fat. And it's fat? Can you say something else about it? And How many legs does it have? Four. It has four legs. Okay, so tell me three things about a cat. Cat you said it's a, somebody's pet. Somebody's and, pet. And and he and he has fur and, and his fur. Uh -huh. And he finally has four legs. And he has four legs. Very good. <laughs> Tell me three no. things about Lainey Grace. Lainey Grace is a baby. She's a baby. Uh -huh. And she's one year old. And, and she's one years old. She's my baby. And she's your baby. That's your she's baby. She, she's, she's my sister. She's my and. Okay, so all by yourself. Tell me three things about Lainey Grace. All by yourself, go. Lainey is small and she's one small. years old. She's and she's pretty cool. And she's pretty cool? Aww, I think she's pretty cool too. Here we go. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm really excited because I have a new friend that I just met. I already feel like we're bonding here. Uh, but Gina Giambe Peters, mm -hmm. uh, Gina, is here and she created a wonderful... I always am astounded by parents who get things done, who are movers and shakers, and you saw a need in your community. I did. And you created something that's called the Center for Special Needs. So let's talk just about that to okay. start with, about what was the need that you saw and why why did you particularly see the need? Who? Um, why I saw the need. So my son was diagnosed, unofficially diagnosed, when he was about 14 months old. Mm -hmm. We had issues with him um, crying a lot, not being consoled, um, sensory issues, which at that time I didn't know what they were. Mm -hmm. And um, they told me he was probably on the autism spectrum. And then when he was about three, uh, about two and a half, three years old, we went to Tri-County Regional Center because um, I live out in Ventura County. Mm -hmm. And then he was officially diagnosed with a developmental pediatrician there and the psychologist. And um, so when he was diagnosed, um, that was, gosh, eight years ago because he's 11, they guided me towards a book and a website mm -hmm. and kind of sent me on my way. And I didn't know where to turn. I didn't know what to do, what resources, what that meant, if that meant I was going to essentially lose my son in the sense of he had language and now he's going to um, not have language, not have relationship. I didn't know what that meant. And so in researching, um, I realized that every kid on the spectrum is completely different. And um, so I started reaching out and Googling, I, you know, did the, the online everything and um, I just saw there wasn't a lot of information and resources in my area for yeah. parents so I started a support group that's kind of how I started Isn't that amazing so I started a support group and um, at that time I became a single parent and um, it was the most popular support group in my area there was a lot of families that came mm -hmm. and I sort of had a criteria where if you came to the support group there was no judgment because every kid's different and we all choose different paths on how we treat our children and do interventions. So from there I just started gathering information and I know you asked me earlier when I first came in about being the email lady yes. um, because that was what I was called in the beginning because everyone that came to my support group I started a um, list. Yeah. And then I started all the research and information I found I started emailing everyone. <laughs> And, and so that turned into Center for Special Needs. Several years later. So um, I, as I gathered information, I put together a website mm -hmm. because I had all these papers everywhere. And 
um, it became where I need to put this all in one location so everyone can access it. And um, I didn't want to be diagnosis specific because not everyone has a diagnosis yes. or a clear diagnosis or some don't meet the diagnostic criteria for right. a diagnosis. The so dreaded XPDD-NOS yes. um, and so many other things. that it, it, It's so interesting how you know your child could have one symptom very severe but be missing this symptom and that used to met, mean that you were out in the cold, that you got right. no services. Right. Or some kids have a gamut of different things right. and then they don't fit into that cookie quarter, cutter disorder and then they're kind of left in the dust. Yes. So I called it Center for Special Needs and I started the website. Um, and as a single mom and a stay-home mom, um, I didn't really have the resources to start a nonprofit, mm -hmm. but I saw the need. And I saw how many kids and their families were not getting the support they needed. A lot of families don't, their kids don't qualify for resources, you know, at the regional center. They don't qualify for services. And so they're left with not providing much for their kids. Yeah. So my goal was if I started a foundation that I would help in that area and provide resources for families. So instead of trying to maneuver that when they've already had the challenges of their kids, it would be all in one location. Wonderful. And so you are now a 501c3? Since 2011. Wonderful. And, and we should let people know what the website is and let them know that you do take donations if there's anybody out Definitely. that would like to donate. Mm -hmm. um, so what your website is? is Centerforspecialneeds.org and it's the number four. The number four. So you can go there, wealth of information there, all different ways mm -hmm. that you can uh, participate with the group. But, uh, you know, I, I think it always bears saying that you take donations because who knows who who's watching that says, hey, I want to be a part of that and I'd like to donate to something like that. Yes. Because uh, it's a wonderful thing. But you, but now tell what the, what the overriding mission is, where you're trying to get and the kinds of things that you do now. So uh, what we started with was I felt like parents really needed to be educated and provided resources. So the areas that I started that was um, doing a conference. So we're on our third annual conference, which we have one coming up, and I know we're going to talk about we that. We are going to talk about that. <laughs> that was the, that's the ABCs and XYZs of special needs that's conference. Right. And mm -hmm. we are going to talk about more of that in a minute because it's a wonderful thing. Thank you. But what are some of the other things that you have going on? So the conference is one of them, and, you know, obviously fundraising is our biggest. So our biggest part of our mission is providing resources education, but also the monetary resources for interventions. So our bylaws are Ventura County um, because that's where I live and I feel like you have to kind of feed your family first. That's right. So we started um, with doing some fundraising last year. We had our first gala last year which was called Bridging the Gaps of Hope. Mm -hmm. So that was held at the Moore Park Country Club and um, we had some goals and we met our goals and that is really to um, provide the meats and the potatoes for the families and that's the interventions and the treatments. Mm -hmm. So families that don't qualify for regional center services and also do not have enough insurance benefits through their insurance companies to provide things like ABA, um, OT, physical therapy, speech therapy, mm -hmm. uh, recreation activities, all social skills, all the things that are important for children, not only with autism, but with other developmental disorders. Yes. So that's really our big area. So when you mention donors, we do need donors. We Absolutely. need monthly sponsors. Um, we need grants. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we need to build that fund that we have so we can help families. And that's really the area where we're starting to move into. So we're still a baby. I'm three years old, almost four years old as a nonprofit. But, you know, we're moving and, and growing. But it's an inspiration, and, and we always like to feature people on this show because there are a lot of parents that are out there watching around the world who, who are sitting there saying, I feel like there's nothing where I live. Mm -hmm. And that is such a helpless feeling. It is. Um, but I always like to show people like you who say, so I'm going to make something. You see a need, you fill it. And, and I would imagine that it's come back to you um, in ways that you didn't know that it could. That by, being, by starting a support group, they and you had a support group. Uh, uh, yes, very much so. And and that, you know, I'm sure that it hasn't been easy and that you've taken on a lot by right. doing this, but I would hope that there's been a benefit to you personally and to your son as well, to, to, that you've had help getting him the things that he needed because of doing this. Well, I think, I think the biggest thing is it's mostly a heart thing. You know, um, I can give the examples of the conference when uh, we've done the two previous conferences. Um, at the end, uh, and and at the beginning, I've had 
families, moms, dads um, come up and cry and hug and not just to me but to my parents because my parents have been a huge support oh, to my son and I. We all live together to support my son um, in the, all the areas that he needs support and I could not have done it without them. Awesome. But so when I speak at the beginning of the conference and when I talk about the reasons why and the purpose of the conference, then by the end of the day of the conference, families have been so embraced. They have uh, the resource fair that gives them so many providers in the area that they never even knew existed, right. uh, which is huge because if you don't know it's available to you and out there, then you don't know. Yeah. Uh, where to go for services for your kid or even that it was a service you know yeah. some people have never heard of ABA you yeah. know if no one has say, told them yeah I always say if you don't know what question to ask right. then th you know you're left in the cold sometimes mm -hmm. just hearing somebody else's question right. says oh I, I didn't even know that I could that was a question that to be asked exactly it's true yeah. it's very true so I think that that's been huge I've had families you know just really benefit from the education and the embracement and the support I think that's my those are my biggest goals for the conference is that you know they see a, a, a lot of other families that are even though our child children are all different and they all have different characteristics different qualities different deficits different mm -hmm. challenges we're all going through the same journey yep. so yep. to be around that it feels very you're not alone and you feel very embraced and supported and then to pr be provided with education on topics that some people don't even like to talk about um, that's it's a real benefit to them all right well we should take a break and then come back and talk about the conference okay. in depth uh, but I do want to mention that it's happening on Saturday March 14th it's from 8 a.m. to 3 30 p.m. Uh, but again your website where people can go for more information www.centerforspecialneeds.com but with the number four not spelled out for yeah and it's dot org Dot org, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> uh, dot org. So centerforspecialneeds.org. All right. We're going to be back more with Gina talking about the ABCs and XYZs of special needs after this. Hello there, fellow activist. You're an activist because you're making the world a better place for someone living with autism. Now on Autism Live, you learn all about your children. You learn about their bodies and their brains. But this empowerment moment is all about you. It's about your heart and your soul. Now don't worry, I'm not gonna have you start singing Kumbaya or doing chanting. Let's talk about blessings. One of the blessings of living with a child with autism is learning to love them unconditionally. Learning to love them despite all the ups and downs, all the sacrifices. In fact, you learn to love them more so because of them. I call this my empowerment prayer. God grant me the wisdom to see my disability as an opportunity, the courage to love my child unconditionally, and the faith to live a life of purpose. So going from the sublime to the ridiculous, I have a little song for you today. It's a rap song, so I know that an old or, okay, middle-aged white woman rapping just doesn't seem right, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. My style is a little like Nicki Minaj meets Dr. Seuss. Nancy's Autism Rap. It's just a diagnosis, your life's not over. Don't lay there like a dog, get up, Rover. You say your head is spinning with GF, CF, ABA, IEPs, and neurofeedback? Autism tough, that much is true, but you'll survive because you're you. Your life's not over, it's just begun, so walk out that door and go be someone. More Dr. Seuss than Nicki Minaj. Until next time. Stay strong and keep the faith. <laughs> Welcome back to Autism Live. We are here with our very special guest, Gina Giambi Peters. She founded Center for Special Needs, and they have a really wonderful conference coming up. This is your third annual. This is our third. And you call this the ABCs and XYZs of Special Needs Conference. I love that title. Thank you. It's very catchy, Thank and it you. really says what, what you're going to get. I love it too. I can't say that I can take the credit for it. Uh -huh. um, our one of our, our 
advisory members at Cecilia Laufenberg. She's the director of the Therapeutic Park and Rec. Well, she came up with the title, it's, so it's she gets lovely. the credit, it but I love it. Catchy, and it says exactly what it is. This year, it's happening on Saturday, March 14th, yes. from 8 a.m. to 3.30 p.m., and you got a wide range of topics to be covered. Uh, I, I want to talk about, I, I, you know, and you can help me jump in here, but you've got <laughs> IEPs in due process, yes. the ABCs of special needs planning, Oh my gosh, you know, mm -hmm. this is something that we all need to be aware of that nobody Definitely. wants to, but you, you know, you have to buckle down and be able to do that. You have stuff on uh, nutrition and biomedical. Uh, you've got creating a sensory enriched environment for children's develop, uh, development with pract practical strategies to address sensory needs. Huge yes, topic that gets huge topic. under talked mm -hmm. about. Uh, I love that you've got something about reading and comprehension in here. Thank you. These are great topics. Thank Thank you. I think so too. <laughs> uh, and then uh, another one here, co-occurring disorders, mm -hmm. something that, you know, because you can be uh, watching our show, doing all kinds of things, doing, uh, reading up all about autism, but when you've got something very specifically that's happening as well, it can slow things up unless you know what you're doing. So I love that you're talking about that. Uh, you want to take, I'm, I'm monopolizing. No, go ahead. I love uh, it. What parents need to know about assessment and intervention. Love that. Uh, Regional Center, Center's new self-determination yes. law, because all of us are in the in the dark about what it's actually going to mean and how it's actually working. Dentistry. That's what a, a new one. a wide variety yeah. of things here. Thank you, thank you. And then how to handle the homework hour, uh, which- All huge issues. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I that I want to put a picture of me with my hair standing straight <laughs> on that next to it going, because uh, that's the fun, fun hour. And if that were all you were doing, this would be heaven divine, right? <laughs> it would be. 11 amazing workshops with some fabulous speakers, professionals that are delivering the workshops. Absolutely. And and we should say that you've got them in three different sessions there, so people have to pick and choose. You're, it's like the menu. You're right. not going to be able to eat it all. Right. Uh, you got to pick, you got to prioritize which one you want to do. But you also, before the break, we were talking about something really, you have your resource fair, but at your resource fair, tell them what's going to be there because it makes me very happy. Well, this is new. This is the special ability. I make sure I get the, the name right. See, I have to use my cheat sheet too. <laughs> um, the special ability entrepreneur boutique. So that is new. Every year we try to change things a little bit. Mm -hmm. And um, the two things that we've changed this year in the conference is we've extended the conference for the length of the day. Mm -hmm. um, prior, the last two years prior, we have done session one and session two, and we've ended at 1.30. We did a survey after the last conference, and a lot of parents wanted more. Yeah. They wanted to stay for lunch. They wanted the camaraderie of other parents during lunch, and they wanted more education. So we extended the day. So that was one of them, and we're providing lunch for families at a very reasonable cost. Okay. And the other thing is the boutique. Yeah. So the boutique was, you know, we have some really talented teenagers and adults that have special needs. And this is a collaboration with Reed's Gift, mm -hmm. um, which they work with teens and adults, and it is to showcase their abilities. Love so it helps them in the sense of building their business, if that's what they're going to do, and the goods that they create, uh, giving them working with social skills and selling and, you know, handling money and, and all of those type of things. But the other part of that is I thought about all the parents that have younger children. So when you receive a diagnosis or you know your child um, maybe isn't like everyone else, has a lot more challenges and difficulties, it's good to know in the future yeah. the potential of abilities. Yeah. So to me, it was a twofold in doing that. So I, I hope that it grows. I'm sure that it'll start small, kind of like the conference, but I hope that it grows. And um, I know you did mention to me that any of the entrepreneurs that um, participated, if they were interested, they could also appear on Autism Live. And they absolutely can, because we love to showcase ability here and uh, we regularly love to have individuals who are on the autism spectrum who okay. like to talk about what their interests are. And of course, one of our overreaching topics this year that I want to showcase is how employable right. our kids are. 
how employable they are, and uh, and the fact that you've got a whole bunch of entrepreneurs who are employing themselves. Right. That's the next step <laughs> along the way, right? Well, so that's we awesome. want to encourage that. Right. Uh, so absolutely be offering that to them. And you know, I think our viewers know that it, we've had many people write in and say, this is what I'm doing, and we love to showcase when individuals who are on the spectrum are working or are their own business owners. We love that. Good. So, but back to the ABCs and XYZs, a special needs conference. Uh, wonderful, wonderful day. There, uh, you know, as if it couldn't get better, you just keep pushing the envelope. <laughs> and so we can tell that you get it. Right. Because the very next sentence on the flyer is free, limited childcare. Right. Uh, you can say, you know, uh, is that a first come, first serve? Or? Well, it is. And so, um, you know, I first want to say that, you know, every parent gets to choose, parent, caregiver, or professional, mm -hmm. uh, gets to choose which topic they come to, to in each session. But we in, encourage couples to come because mm -hmm. then you can do two for one. Right. You know, you can each hit a workshop in each session and get a lot more education. Yeah. Uh, we do have the free child care on site mm -hmm. uh, provided by Channel Island Social Services. Love it. So you can contact them directly. And the phone number there is 805-384. 0983. Um, that's Channel Island Social Services, and it is a first come, first serve. It depends on you know how many children we get to register and the staff that we have to um, accompany them and take care of them for the day. Okay, it's very. There is a cost to come to the conference. There is, but it's incredibly reasonable. It is incredibly reasonable, and so we do want to encourage people um, to go to Center for Special Needs. Uh, and, and on here it says .com. Should it be .org on the bottom down here where it says to contact? Oh, that's the in, that's email. Info oh, that's at Center Special. Yeah. yeah okay. it's, so if you have any questions, there we you can go. email. But the See, website. That's all right. <laughs> the website <laughs> Center for Special Needs .org. You okay. can get to it by .com. Okay. Also, it'll redirect you to the dot .org. And there's a phone number 805-379-1681. And this is happening in Ventura County. The actual location of it, you're in Westlake Village. So the location is it's hosted by Calvary Community. Church. They okay. have collaborated with us the last three years. Uh -huh. um, so it's in Westlake at 5495 Via Rocas. Okay. Families can register online. They can call in to register if they don't have access to computers, which okay. some families don't. So we yeah. want to make that available to people. Um, if you register prior to February 28th, you're at early bird registration. Uh -huh. You can register for the first two sessions. And if you can't do the full day, or if you can do the full day, you can register for all three sessions. We do honor heroes, our heroes in, in our country. And so military families are free and scholarships are always available. So for us, uh, we have sponsors. Johnny and Friends has sponsored us for our conference. Um, we have a few other sponsors as far as, you know, media sponsors, um, Connect to Wellbeing Magazine, they sponsor us. Fresh Agency sponsors us. Uh, Channel Island Services has sponsored our, um, I always like to mention the sponsors because we couldn't Absolutely. do things without them. Absolutely. But, Johnny and Friends has been our educator sponsor. Mm -hmm. So for families that want to come and they cannot afford to come, we don't want to turn anyone down. Okay. We want everyone to be able to be there who wants to be there. Okay. So there are scholarships available upon request. Okay. So make sure, don't ever let that stop you. Make sure that if you, you know, if you want to go and if money is an issue, make sure that you're applying for it. But it's so reasonable that the early bird starts as low as $40 for two sessions. And I love that you give a discount if it's a couple. So it's $60 Thanks. for a couple. And then as you get closer and if you add more in, it, it, it scales up from there. Um, but incredibly reasonable for yeah. that kind of a day. Now, uh, it needs to be. Because, yeah. as, you know, as you know, being a parent to a child with special needs, a lot of our resources go to our kids yeah. and providing therapies. So getting education for ourselves is really important, but it's probably not on the top of the list. So we need to make it reasonable for families to be okay. able to attend. Okay. And so, again, centerforspecialneeds.org. Yes. The number four to find out more information about this, and they can find more information about you and about your life. But really very remarkable. We thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having us and having me and, and Center for Special Needs and spotlighting We'd us. We'd love to have you back again. So thank let you. us know whenever you have something going on. We're going to take a break, and then we're going to be back with more of Autism Live after these messages. you find out you're having a boy you always think like oh he's gonna play football he's gonna do this and that and then when he's diagnosed all those things get washed away 
it's like that peace that's always in the back of your mind, you know, where is he, what is he doing, is he safe? We really didn't know what we were dealing with. I wish that they could have directed me a little bit more and provided me some information. I was a young mom. I didn't know what it was like to raise a boy despite a boy with autism. Hundreds of thousands of families are not getting the help they need for their children with autism all around the country. ACT Today is determined to bridge the gap. These families really have to go through a lot to get a grant. The application process isn't easy. The records, the diagnosis proof, they're really battling for their kids. So when we can give them a grant, it is so wonderful to see that they succeed in getting that help for their children. Our founder, Dr. Doreen Grampiche, is an amazing woman, and she is one of the world's foremost authority on behavior of children with autism. She's extremely knowledgeable, and she oversees every single grant we give. She is part of that process. People may think of autism care and treatment as simply schooling or therapy, but you know, we provide important safety supports, things like fencing, for example. The whole family's living in fear of that child running out into traffic. I recently delivered an iPad to a little boy with some of the apps that are out there for children with autism. Miracles happen. I got the iPad from ACT. From ACT, What yes. did it say? Can you repeat that, Dustin? I got the iPad from that. We have helped so many military families. And when I think of these brave families that are fighting two battles, one to protect our country and one for the right treatment and care for their children, it, it breaks my heart. And I think we have to do more as a nation to help them. There's not a day that doesn't go by that we don't think about it. Some people say, oh, he's normal. You you don't see the battles that I see every single day. My husband does have to deploy, and when they get on that bus, that might be the last time that my kids ever see them. So I called, and then they informed me that he had received the grant, which was like a blessing from above. I was just like speechless. I just started to cry because, you know, without it, we would, we would have been lost. The ACT grant was a total miracle, and without that, they wouldn't be able to receive a service dog, so we're so appreciative of what they've done for us as a family. Recently, ACT Today funded a program for military children with autism in San Diego, the Inclusion Films program, which is run by Joey Travolta, and teaches uh, kids on the autism spectrum literal filmmaking skills. They learn how to make a movie. Are we ready? There you go, got it. Okay. Everything that goes into the process of making a film goes into everyday life. So they're learning life skills, they're learning to collaborate. It was really nice to know how much they were enjoying this camp. And they're with people who are supporting them and are making them feel great about themselves and their differences and their similarities. And I get two kids that are working together and apart and together and apart. So it's an interrelationship as well as a camp and a learning experience. It's so fulfilling when I get letters. One stands out for me, a, a boy who was 14 with Asperger's, and we gave him a grant to go to a drama camp. He wrote to us and said, Dear Act Today, thank you for letting me belong for the first time in my life. These kids are remarkable. You know, we underestimate them. They're so knowledgeable, they're so capable, and we can change the life of a family, which means changing the life of a community. Another parent wants to know, how do I find out that one thing that my kid is really good at? Now when they get older, they're going to kind of divide into two groups. You're going to have the kids that become verbal, mm -hmm. and then you're going to have the kids that are nonverbal, got many more problems, maybe they still have epilepsy or some other problem. And they kind of need different services. And the ones that get verbal, they, what we need to be doing with them is develop the area of strength. And that area of strength often will show up around third or fourth grade, sometimes earlier. But my ability in art showed up when I was in third and fourth grade, and it was always encouraged. And I was encouraged to do lots of different kinds of art. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would have just been endless horse heads. Mm -hmm. You know, mother would say to me, why don't you draw a picture of a beach <laughs> or, or something else? Mm -hmm. it's, 
it's uh, you, you want to broaden it out. If the kid's fixated on trains, let's teach reading with trains, math with trains. Tap into that fixation, mm -hmm. but develop the area of strength. Some kids it's going to be art. Other kids it's going to be mathematics. So you've got a third grader who's smart in math, and he wants a sixth grade math book, give him the sixth grade math book. Don't bore him with the baby stuff. But that kid's going to have trouble with reading. Because the common thing is the uneven skills. And then you have the kids that are the history buffs, and these kids are often really good at writing skills. You tend to have uneven skills. But tap into their fixations and use those to motivate. But broaden. If he likes trains just watching them, well, we're going to take that interest in trains to do some math with it. Or maybe read about the history of the railroad. You know, tap into that motivation. One of the things I really want to talk about is we've got to stretch these kids. I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about physically stretching them mentally stretching them, stretching them to do new things. I'm seeing too many kids that haven't learned how to shop, how to order food at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. So you start out, let's say it's ordering food at McDonald's or at Burger King. So you take them up there and they watch you order it. And then eventually you go in when the store's not busy and they have to go up and order it while you're sitting at the table watching and then you coach them. And then eventually they can go in the restaurant themselves. I can remember I was scared to go to the lumber yard alone and buy lumber. My mother made me go. And she knew I could do it. I had done bought lumber with her many times. But there's a tendency to want to have somebody else there when they do it. And they've got to learn how to do things alone. Mm -hmm. And you gradually have got to kind of push it. You've got to stretch them. And I'm seeing too many kids not learning basic skills. So a 19-year-old honor student that actually knows how to drive that had never shopped in the grocery store all by herself. That is just ridiculous. You know, you've got to stretch them. You push too hard, they're going to be panic. And, and, and the other thing is no surprises. No surprises. I knew all about the ranch long before I went there. I had talked to Ann. But if you don't stretch these kids, they don't grow. Welcome back to Autism Live. Um, still uh, feeling so blessed, that our guest that we just had. Um, and taking a look at some of the things that you guys have written in, uh, somebody wrote in and said, Hi, Shannon, I was trying to get my head around which pans, pots are the safest ones for our kids. Stainless steel, ceramic, etc. cetera, which, which dishes, glass, porcelain. Uh, also, I was told to uh, avoid aluminum foil in baking. What can I use instead? What kind of baking sheets? And thank you for your program. You are God sent. And we uh, appreciate you and feel the same way about you. Um, well, you know, um, here's what I know, and I will uh, completely admit to not being a complete expert on this. But yes, I have been told that the first thing that you need to do uh, is go through your pots and pans and take anything that has Teflon and get rid of it. And don't save it, get rid of it. Uh, I would encourage you not even, I, I'm always about donate to the Goodwill because somebody can always use something, but really we want to get rid of Teflon. Uh, and, and I don't just mean Teflon, Teflon because that is uh, a product name, but anything that's non-stick, and I do mean anything that's non-stick, get rid of it. We have interviewed um, Ken Cook from the Environmental Working Group. He's the one that has that list about the dirty dozen and the clean 15 that we always talk about in terms of which where you want to spend your money on organic. And he urges people that that's one of the best things that you can do health-wise is get rid of that non-stick. I am told, and again, I am not an expert in this, but I have attended conferences and seen people present on the fact that uh, when you uh, ever heat up that material, if there is ever a period of time when there is nothing in it, uh, and, and that is exposed to the air that the amount of toxic stuff that comes off of it within seconds is enough to kill your parakeets in the room. Uh, so it can't be good for our kids, right? I mean, I think we can just assume that it can't be good for our kids. Uh, and I have, I have friends who've said, well, then I'll just make sure that the surface is covered. And I was one of those people for a while. I used to have one of those pancake griddles that was nonstick, because how are you gonna make a pancake without it being nonstick was my feeling of things. And if you stop and think, you put the pancake on, but there are all that air Area around the pancake that is off-gassing. Throw it away. Just get rid of it. That's one of the best things you can do health-wise. Now, after that, the secondary thing after that is uh, trying to reduce the amount of aluminum that we all have in our diet. We know that um, it is not good for our brains to take in too much aluminum that we've, we've heard for um, Alzheimer patients, but for all of us throughout our 
life, we want to reduce the amount of aluminum intake that we have. So um, aluminum pans are the ones that are very lightweight. Uh, they're the cheaper pans and they're very lightweight. So that will help you to know that. If something is stainless steel, you will see that there's a stamp on it that will tell you which grade of stainless steel. There are some that are better than other and I, that I cannot tell you. I am told that ceramic pans, as long as you see that they do not have lead in them, so very old ceramic pans, you, you cannot assume that. But when you buy a ceramic pan, if it says, you know, no lead, then you're, you're good. Um, Glass pans, um, you, you have to just be careful about that you don't uh, heat up your oven too high because they can shatter. Uh, so that for any of those Pyrexy kind of pans or glass dishes that you use in an oven, most of them have a rating and, and I would be careful about not going over 400 um, and never putting them in, a, in an oven which you are preheating because you know when you preheat your oven it can, depending on your oven, it can balloon up to 500 which can shatter your pans and I have had that happen. It is not a fun thing so be careful about um, using glass for that kind of thing. Uh, a lot of people like the, the, the cast iron um, pans. Be very careful about what they've been seasoned with because you want them seasoned with non-GMO. Um, other people prefer not to do um, the, the cast iron. I try to do a mix now that I have stainless steel pans and I have cast iron pans. I use my cast iron for things that do not, are not high in acid. So if I'm going to be cooking with tomatoes, I don't do it in my cast iron pan because it's reactive to it. If I'm going to do something with a lot of lemon juice in it, that's, uh, you know, higher in acid, not as much as the tomato. I don't do it in the cast iron pan. I do those in my stainless steel pans. And if you want, um, um, sometimes people uh, get stainless steel pans that have an aluminum core in them, and those are safe if it's completely sealed. Uh, the reason why people like aluminum is that it heats really high, really fast, and it's lightweight. But you can you can get some pans that it's aluminum core. That's perfectly okay as long as what's touching the food is um, not aluminum. And, and of course, you brought up the whole thing of foil, not cooking with aluminum foil. Yes, you really want to reduce or eliminate aluminum foil from your repertoire. What can you use instead? Well, if it's something that you're wanting to put down to keep a pan clean, there is parchment paper, and I encourage you to get the one that's all natural, that it's, uh, it's not white, it's a brown color. It actually cooks better than the white ones. Um, you can get those uh, and make sure that it's all natural. Parchment paper is fabulous. Don't make the mistake of thinking that wax paper and parchment paper are the same thing. They're not. The wax paper will catch on fire in your oven. I've done it. Uh, <laughs> It's just keeping it real. Uh, but if you're using it to cover something, um, then I, I'm sure that you can use parchment paper um, for some things, but it's going to stick to other things. Uh, consider getting pans that, um, you know, the, the ceramic pans that have the glass lid. I have those um, for things that I need to have covered, a covered dish like that instead of aluminum foil. And I, um, when I, I love to cook uh, roast chicken and roast turkeys and I used to have one of those big beautiful fabulous open roasting pans in which to do that in that had the little cradle so that the the thing could sit there and now I've gone back to uh, the old-fashioned like my uh, grandmother had the the ones that are ceramic uh, that have the lid and sometimes if the turkey is really big it doesn't fit all the way and life goes on um, but it helps to cook it and roast it beautifully I can make a beautiful roasted turkey in that and there's no foil involved. Uh, okay, so uh, hopefully that answered your question from somebody who is not an expert. Uh, and we will, you can always check on environmental working group, ew.org, um, to see what they rate specific pans for how safe they are. Um, for, and they will include a lot of different things in their rating as well. So I encourage you to check that out. All right, we're going to take a break and we're going to come back to close out the show and close out the week. And I'm going to talk about where I'm going on Saturday, a very special event, the Mardi Gras for Autism. So stick with us.
There's been another new study about optimal outcomes, and I wanted to know what are your thoughts on recovery? Do you think it's possible? Do you believe in recovery from autism? On recovery, you learn how to adapt. I mean, I've had a lot of experimental brain scans done, and I have found things that are definitely abnormal. I have an enlarged left ventricle that's definitely abnormal. That's not going to go away. That scan was done less than five years ago. But you work with someone and they adapt. Uh, you're not going to make me an algebra specialist. Uh, that's just not going to happen. But things like learn, getting better at public speaking, that is something that I gradually learned. What I'm seeing today, especially with some of the kids on the mild end of the spectrum, I'm seeing teenagers that are much milder than me that haven't learned things like how to go up to the counter at McDonald's and order food all by themselves how to go on the bus, uh, how to shop, how to go in the store and shop, how to do a checkbook, basic things like that. Because what drives me crazy is when I go back to the cattle world and I see a guy in the maintenance shop that's running the whole maintenance shop at a big plant and he's as Asperger as he can be and he's running a whole maintenance shop. And then I see Junior that's uh, addicted to video games and you can't get his duff off his chair and, and get him doing things. Now when I was in high school, I did a lot of thinking about this. Um, I got kicked out of a large girls' school for throwing a book, and I went to a special boarding school up on a farm, and I was allowed to work with the farm animals. And they let me goof off and not study. But I got to thinking, there's one thing they did not let me do. I goofed off and I didn't study, but I had to physically go to class. When I didn't want to go to the Friday night movie, they made me the projectionist. One thing they were not going to let me do is sit in my room, become a recluse in my room. They were not going to allow that. I want to know why you threw the book. Who'd you, why did you throw it? Oh, the, I threw a throw book it? at a girl because she called me a retard. Oh, good reason. Oh, no, to throw she it teased up. me. And I had some problems getting in fights when kids teased me. But it was always brought about by someone picking on me. And the principal had me kicked out of school, out of a large girls' school for doing that. And what'd your mom say? Well, uh, she was not very happy about the whole thing because when the principal called, I answered the phone and he said I was incorrigible and I was kicked out of school. Mm -hmm. Mother was really angry that he just said that right directly to me, yeah. which was definitely not very appropriate. Temple always puts a smile on my face. Uh, we, we are uh, trying to see when we can have her on again. That's another reason why you should sign up for that email list so that when she's on, usually I, you know, I'll call her and say, Temple, when you, can you be on? And Temple will frequently say, well, I'm free now, right? <laughs> and I want a way to let you know when we're going to have her on. So make sure you sign up for our free email list. Uh, that way you will get notified when she says that. Uh, okay, I wanted to cycle back really quickly because some messages came in when Dr. Uh, Nadowski was talking about the handwriting that I didn't see because I didn't scroll down because I, I'm, sometimes I'm an idiot like that. Uh, but you said that, yes, your son is copying now and that your teacher is using um, handwriting without tears, which is great. Um, and that your question was, am I reinforcing the meltdowns through coming in the room when he gets frustrated? Here's the thing that I can tell you that I've learned over the years is that so, something happens um, and then if we pair something with it, then it becomes part of it. So if while your son is frustrated, you come in the door and stop what's happening, you will be reinforcing the tantrum. He will start to link that up. Very small, minute change, which your OT already had you do, and I think that's probably why Dr. Nadowski didn't ad address it, was while he was frustrated and he was crying, she didn't have you come in. She had you wait until after he had calmed down. And sometimes that can be just that they are calm for seven seconds. But if they have been calm for seven seconds and you come in, what your child links up is that once I calm down, mom comes. Do you see how different that seven seconds can be? Um, and that's an okay thing to teach them, that when you self-regulate, you get something wonderful like mom, and you do want to reinforce the self-regulation that it takes to calm down. So I think you did it just exactly perfectly and your OT talked you through it exactly perfectly. And I think the fact that you were lovey-dovey with him afterwards and saying to him, you know, I'm sorry that you were frustrated and this is a really hard task, I think all of that is perfectly okay because what you rewarded was the self-regulation. If you come in at the height of the tantrum, you will do the exact opposite and it really can be that big of a difference, seven seconds of what you're reinforcing and what you're not. Um, but, you know, it sounds like your OT was on it. Um, and for you to know that I used to stand there and count sometimes. My son would tantrum, and I would be totally say, and he'd be, Mom! 
you know, and you want to turn and look to it and I would be do doing something else. And, you know, watering plants was always my fail safe. I'll go and water the plants um, because it's a way for me to be busy and still attend to, you know, for that moment that eventually he would calm down and he would say, Mom, I, 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 I want to talk to you. And then I would immediately, yes, what can we do? Um, and what he learned was I have to get myself together in order for her to give me the attention. Uh, it's a powerful, powerful thing. And I would literally stand there and count, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, without saying the Mississippi's between, but we, we really want to be careful that we don't reinforce the, all the emotionalism. Uh, but on the same token too, to, you know, we, we, they have to, we have to allow them to have their emotions, but not the hysteria, uh, that when they calm down, that then they're going to get what they want. Okay. Uh, I have just a couple of minutes left here. Hopefully that helps. Uh, I just want to bring up that happy Valentine's day to everyone. Uh, I hope that at some point over this weekend that you're really nice to yourself and, and remember to, it starts at home, right? Which starts with you first, be loving to yourself think of a way to reinforce yourself to say that you love you to yourself i know that's hard because you're probably the last person on your list but it doesn't have to be something big you know if your dream is to have a a, a four-hour spa trip right and you can't do that and you think to yourself okay you know and even taking a half hour to myself to take a bath probably isn't going to get that done but you know maybe on one of the nights you can get the kids to bed early and take an extra long shower and say, this is the gift that I'm going to give to myself. Uh, and I'm going to, you know, purchase a, a soap that costs me a dollar more than I would normally spend so that when I have that shower, that extra long shower, that I have something wonderful, you got to reinforce yourself, right? And then stop and make sure that you are uh, kind and loving to everybody else uh, that means something to you. I was in a conversation the other day with somebody who said, you know, sometimes I just get so mad. Uh, and I said, oh, been there, done that right? But uh, if you have somebody that you love in your life, sometimes things can change in a moment. Don't be one of those people that regrets not having said the I love you. You can't over say it, right? But start with yourself. Now on Saturday, I am going to get some time to spend with my boys on Saturday. But first, I'm going to be at the Mardi Gras for Autism, which is the wonderful event. We had Larry Hauser on the show last week. Fullerton Cares, which happens in Fullerton, California. Uh, and you can look up FullertonCares.com to find out more information about this event. Every spring on the Saturday before Fat Tuesday, they have a Mardi Gras for Autism. It raises money for Fullerton cares which goes back into the community to help support the autism community in Fullerton and it is a wonderful event if you're anywhere close it's a great place to go and take the kids neurotypical or on the spectrum or both uh, there are games to play there are activities to do it is a ticket situation where you buy tickets to be able to turn them in to be able to do some of the different events that are really spectacular like usually the aquarium in the Pacific is there and if you want to go in and touch a sea cucumber you can but you donate a little bit of money to be able and it's not much but a little bit of money to be able to get a ticket to go in to do that there are a bunch of free events as well things to do and there are volunteers everywhere to make the kids have a good time all the kids leave with a bunch of mardi gras necklaces uh it's almost overkill there are so many people there that are like trying to give you a necklace uh it's crazy town uh <laughs> it's all the good things to do with mardi gras but everyone has their shirts on um so it is kid approved uh, wonderful event to be at. There's food opportunities there as well. That goes from 11 to 4. I will be there at the Autism Live booth, and with me will be Juan Ronderos from our Autismo e Familia segment, which is our, our Spanish spoken portion of our show that happens on Fridays. So if you want to meet Juan, uh, there's the perfect opportunity to be able to meet Juan. And of course, I will be there too. I'm like the poor relation. Juan is, you know, he's a handsome young man everybody wants to meet Juan but I'm there too uh and we we do give away free hugs there at the booth so and and by the way we're gonna have some games for the kids to play at the booth but we're gonna be uh giving away a lot of uh gifts on the hourly basis at the booth so uh we we're, we're nailing down exactly what we have but I believe we have some IBT trainings and we might even have some skills subscriptions to give away at the booth a reason to get out on Saturday and then we can all go home and have love 
lovely romantic dinners. My boys are going to be cooking dinner while I'm at the thing, uh, at the Mardi Gras for autism. So uh, in any case, it's been a really exciting week. Been thrilling to be here with you guys. I want to talk just briefly about some of the different things that we have going on next week, most especially that on Tuesday, Dr. Linda Copeland is going to be with us in the second hour. She is a developmental pediatrician and a board certified behavior analyst. And if that sounds amazing and wild and like, ooh, I haven't heard that before, it's because you probably haven't heard that before because she's a unicorn. It's like it doesn't exist anywhere but in her. So uh, what a great opportunity to be asking a question about some of the medical things going on with your child from somebody who understands the behavioral way you're looking at things. So be writing those questions in. I, I am going to send her those questions tomorrow morning, so be writing them in today. Let us know what you would like to know from a developmental pediatrician who is also a board-certified behavior analyst. Uh, also, I mentioned we're not going to have uh, Dr. Del Nadowski next week, but we get Dr. Jonathan Tarbox back. He has been home sitting under his precious new baby, and we've wanted him to have that time, but he will be back with us next week. But we lose Dr. Nadowski next week, but we will get uh, Kara, because I hope I'm saying it right, Kozinski, who is the pocket OT. She's going to be with us to talk about 10 tips to help you have a play date, a success, a successful, I can't even talk anymore, I'm trying to fit it all in, success successful play day with neurotypical child and a child on the autism spe spectrum. So really looking forward to that. But also on top of that, we have Ask Dr. Doreen on Wednesday and our special guest during Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy next week is Marsha Hines, author of the book, I Know You're In There. I know you guys are going to love that and ever so much more. So uh, try to tune in over the weekend. I'll try to post a couple of pictures from the Mardi Gras from autism on our Facebook page or on our Instagram, which I am now charge to to do things on our instagram and so follow us on both of those so that you can see what we did we're totally out of time but i adore you all thank you for being here with me and please give your kiddos a hug from me and a special extra hug for me for happy valentine's day and i'll see you back after president's day until then bye bye for now